Okay, going to be working on the homework for uh, 10-7. There's quite a few problems in here, so maybe several hours of videos, I'm sure. So number one, I'm doing numbers one through 11. So number one, uh, find the domain. So I want to find the domain of the following vector function, r of t equals the vector square root 4 minus t squared, so e to the negative 3t, and natural log of uh, t plus 1. So all we're trying to figure out is what t's I can and cannot plug in to this vector function. Um, I have some issues, square roots. Um, I cannot have a negative number under here. And then natural log, I cannot have a negative um, I can't have a negative number under here or in here either. So this argument must be greater than or equal to zero, and this radicand must be greater than or equal to zero. So I'm going to go ahead and, and look at those two. First of all, um, 4 minus t squared has to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, that's called a quadratic inequality, and the way that we can solve this is first converting it over to an equation, getting our two solutions, which would be positive and negative 2, plotting those two solutions on a number line, and then just checking some points to see if those satisfy the original inequality. So if I try negative 3, plug negative 3 in here, this will not be true. If I plug a number like 0 in here, uh, 4 is greater than 0, that is true. And then if I plug in something like 3, that won't be true. So I know that everything between negative 2 and 2 will work. So this is interval notation, all x values that are an element of this closed set. Remember, it can be 2, right? If I plug in 2, I get 0. That's OK. Square root of 0 is defined. Um, I need to look at this one now. Also, keep in mind that I'm not looking at this because e to the e, e can be raised to anything. Doesn't matter if it's a positive number, could be a negative number, could be zero. Doesn't matter. E is well defined, so no domain issues with the with the with the second component function. So on this one, I need t plus one to be greater than zero, um, strictly greater than zero. Right? Can't be equal to zero. So t must be greater than negative 1. That's just a linear inequality. So that means it's uh, negative 1 to infinity. Oh, I put x here. Oops, t. t must be an element. t must be an element of that. So what I'm going to try and find now is the intersection of those two sets. Um, I can do this uh, in several ways. I'm just going to draw a number line. Uh, the first one says that I have to be between negative 2 and 2, including the endpoints. This one says I must be uh, greater than, strictly greater than negative 1. So negative 1 is here. Um, I have to be greater than negative 1, so out there like that. And I cannot be negative 1. So it's wherever these two sets overlap, which would be this region in here. And I would not want to include negative 1, so something like negative 1. And then I would want to include 2, so 2. But I couldn't go past 2. I couldn't go to the left of negative 1 either. So t must be an element of this set. So your domain is that. You could also write t is greater than negative 1, but less than or equal to 2. Yeah, we're done. OK, I'll let you do number 2 yourself. Um, number 3, we're going to find a limit. The limit as t goes to 0, well, you know what, let me do 4. 4 looks more interesting. We're going to try, we're going to try the limit as t goes to 1 here of the vector function t squared minus t over t minus 1, and then square root t plus 8, and then sine 
pi t over natural log t. So let's see if we have any problems. Let's look at each of the components. As t goes to 1, I get uh, 1 squared minus 1 at 0 over 1 minus 1 at 0. So I get 0 over 0 here. That's a problem. If I plug in 1 here, I get 9. The square root of 9 is defined. That's OK. Here, uh, sine of pi. So remember, sine is the y-coordinate. OK, pi is over here. So sine of pi is 0. And then natural log of 1 is 0. So I get 0 over 0 there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this is equal to, by L'Hopital's rule, Okay, so um, you draw an L or an H here. I'll draw an L, I guess, for L'Hopital. A lot of books use H, but I've always used L. I don't know why. Um, T goes to 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do L'Hopital's rule on, on any of these that have a problem. So um, the derivative of the top here is 2T minus 1, and the derivative of the bottom is 1. And then over here, I don't need to do L'Hopital's rule. And then... Over here, I'm going to do L'Hopital's rule again. So the derivative of the top is cosine pi t, right? But then the derivative of the inside, which is just pi. And then over the derivative of the bottom, derivative of natural log of t is 1 over t. So now let's plug in 1, and let's see what we get. So 1 here, I get 2 minus 1. That's going to be 1 on top. 1 over 1 is 1, so I get the vector 1. We already said this would be 9, square root of 9 is 3. And then over here, um, cosine of pi, right? Cosine, I plug in 1 there. Cosine of pi is negative 1. And then times pi. So I get negative pi over 1 over 1, which is 1. So that's just negative pi. So the limit is a vector. Just be careful because the limit's a vector. It's not. Uh, it's not a, uh, a number, right? All right, so that's four. Let's look at five. Oh, I'm supposed to just be doing odds. Oops. Okay, let's look at five. Sketch the curve with a given vector equation. Indicate with an arrow the direction in which t increases. So r of t equals sine t phi t. r of t equals sine t t. All right. So this is two-dimensional. So let's make a let's make a t table. This is t. Over here is going to be sine t, t. So if I plug in, let's start with 0. I'll put 0 here in the middle. 0. Sine of 0 is 0, and then 0. So when the clock starts, I'm the 0 vector. Uh, let's go, what do we want to use? I want to use a nice value so I can plug it into sine. How about pi? over 4. So sine of pi over 4 is going to be root 2 over 2, and then pi over 4. OK, so what I'll do is I'll get my calculator out here just to make sure I get these accurate, ac as accurate as possible. So root 2 over 2 is the vector 0 0.707, close enough. And then pi over 2. 1.57. I'm probably going close to off the screen there. So let's say that this is 1. This is 1. This is 2. This is 2. Then I'm at 0.7. So 0.707. Then up 1.57. So somewhere around here. So a vector that goes from here to here. So I've gone from the origin vector up to that vector. And now I can do something like pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. And then, um, oh wait, hold on. This was pi over 4. Oops. Oops. This should have been 0.78. If 
5. Okay, let me bring this back. 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, so something right around there. And then <clears throat> pi over 2, I forgot, 1.57. So I go out 1, 1 1.57 is up here, somewhere around here. So now I'm, I'm at this vector. And then let's do um, 3 pi over 4. So sine of 3 pi over 4 is um, still root 2 over 2. And 3 pi over 4 2.35, something like that. So I'm at root 2 over 2, which is 0 0.707. So it's here, but now I'm up 2.3, so I'm about right here now. Okay, and then I keep going. Let me go to pi. So if I'm at pi, sine of pi is going to be uh, 0, and then pi is 3.14 approximately. So now I'm at 0 and then 3.14. So here's 3, here's 4. So 3.14, I'm about right there. So it's a vector goes straight up to here. And then what's going to happen is I'm going to start to go negative. All right? Start to go negative. My, my, y, my y coordinate's going to keep on getting bigger, right? And my... Um, X coordinate or X component of the vector is going to be going following a sine curve. So remember, sine curves, you know, the traditional sine curve is positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. So my, my um, X value, my X component is going to be positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. So what's happening here is we're basically drawing out almost like a sine curve, but vertically. And then it comes back the other way also like this. So that's it. All right, let's look at number seven, which is, looks like it's three-dimensional. T, 2 minus T, 2T. All right. Oh, by the way, um, on the last problem we did, it looked like this. As T increased, right, as T got bigger, the direction was this way. So when it draws this, it draws it like that as t goes, progresses from smaller to larger numbers. All right, so for this one, again, I can make a, I can make a table. And let's start at zero this time. Uh, 0, 2, 0, and then 1. And it's going to be 1, 1, 2, and then uh, uh, 2, sorry. 2 would be uh, 2, 0, 4. 3 would be 3, negative 1, um, 6. And then I can keep going. So what's happening here is that <clears throat> the x component is just growing, you know, by one each time. The y component is growing by one each time, but it starts at two. And then the, the z component is doubling every every time. So how in the world do we draw that? That's gonna be it's gonna be tricky. Okay, zero two zero would be here. We have a vector going from here to here. And then 1, 1, 2 would be 1, 1, 2 up here. 
so from the origin up to there. And then 204, so 204 would be straight up here like this. And 3, negative 1, which would be back, up 6, be there. So that's going to be really difficult to draw. Um, <clears throat> but the important thing is that it's, it's linear. Okay, so these are connected. So it goes like this. It's a straight line. Okay. And as time goes on, we are actually going in this direction. Number nine, well, number nine is kind of worth drawing. Yeah, let's look at number nine. <clears throat> so for number nine, we have one cosine t, two sine t. One cosine t. 2 sine t. So if I make a table, t, I'm just going to put r of t here this time. If t is 0, I get the vector 1, cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0, so I'm there. If I plug in, uh, what do we want? Let's do pi over 4. I get pi over 4. I'm sorry, 1, that never changes. Uh, cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, root 2 over uh, 2 here, but then times 2, so that's just root 2. And then uh, pi over 2, we get 1 again. Cosine of pi over 2 is 1, I'm uh, sorry, uh, 0. And sine of pi over 2 is 1, but then times 2. So what we should recognize here is that cosine t, sine t, without the 2, that would draw a circle. If I make that a 2, what it does is it draws an ellipse. Now, it's drawing an ellipse in the yz plane, and our x-coordinate's always going to be 1. So here's x, here's y. So my y-coordinate's always 1. So let's say this is 1. And then... Um, if, let me draw a couple of these points. 1, 1, 0, which would be about here. And then uh, 1, root 2, over 2, and up root 2, something like that. And then 1, 0, 2 would be up here. So this is, this is what it's drawn so far, right? And it's going in this direction. And if I continue... this. What it's going to do is it's going to draw this ellipse, okay? But the ellipse is on the, is on the yz plane. It's been moved out one. It just keeps drawing the ellipse over and over and over and over. All right, that's through 11. Or no, I'm going to leave 11 to you. Now, 11 is harder to draw. I, I will admit that. Um, but I'll let you mess with it. All right. All right, so now what? 11. So for 17 through 22, you're supposed to match. Um, let me just do one of these. Seventeen. So let me try and match up the picture. What is x equals t cosine t, y equals t, z equals t sine t. This is also this. There we go. 
So what's happening here when we draw this? Well, notice the, uh, the cosine t, sine t, if that's all we had for these, then it would just draw a circle in the x, z plane. But the fact that the, in front of these I have a t means that the radius, right, that's the radius in front of the cosine and the sine, the radius is actually getting bigger also as, as time gets uh, bigger. So what we should have is in, if we looked at just the x, z plane, we looked at it from just the side, then what it should be drawing is a circle but the radius should start small and get bigger. So it should be, you know, a circle like this. It's trying to draw a circle, but the radius keeps getting bigger. And then what's happening is in the y direction, the y uh, value just gets bigger. You know, t gets bigger, the y value gets bigger. So imagine that as you're drawing this, the y, the y axis is actually um, going away from us because of the right hand rule. But uh, imagine that you start in the middle. Um, and your y coordinate would be, your y component would be zero, and then as you start to draw this, you know, let's say here's the plane, you start to draw this, but your y starts to get bigger, so you're going into the page like this as you're drawing it. So I think that looks like uh, that looks like two on here on your options. Option two looks like this. Option two looks like this. Is it like that? Okay. All right, so you can mess with the rest through 22. Uh, 23. interesting. Show that the, the curve with the parametric, they give you parametric equations, but I'm going to convert it. T cosine T, that looks like what we just looked at. Uh, T sine T and T show that this lies on the cone z squared equals x squared plus y squared. Hmm. All right, so this right here, remember, this would draw a circle in the xy plane with an increasing radius. So that's going to be that spiral looking thing in the xy plane. But then our z coordinates getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it looks something like, you know, in three-dimensional space. And the xy plane, which is the ground, is trying, trying to draw the circle, but the z is getting bigger, so something like that. What we're trying to show is that it lies on this cone. Remember, this is a cone equation, and uh, since z is isolated, the cone opens up in the z direction. So imagine a cone that looks like this. What we're trying to show is that that curve, that parametric curve, is actually on the surface of that cone. Well, this is pretty easy to check, actually, because all we have to do is show that every point on here, right, every point, if we convert these vectors to points, if every point here, every x, every y, every z that comes from that vector equation lies on this cone, we're done. So it, they must satisfy this equation. So all I have to do is replace z with t. So t squared equals x, which is t cosine t squared plus y, which was t sine t squared. And I just have to show that this is true, or figure out when it's true. Like, what, for what value of t is this true? So this is t squared equals, now I'm going to square this, t squared cosine squared t plus square this, t squared sine squared t. These both have a t squared, so factor out a t squared, left with cosine squared t plus sine squared t. But this is equal to 1, so you get t squared equals t squared, which checks out. t squared equals t squared. That's for all t. 
That's true for all t, which means no matter what t I pick, I'm going to satisfy that equation, which means I'm going to live on that cone. And I say to um, sketch the curve, um, I say in the homework to skip it, but there's the sketch. All right, where am I? 25. Okay, so at what points at what points does the curve r of t equals, again, I'm going to the vector form, t, I don't see a j in here, so 0, and then 2t minus t squared, I don't need the parentheses. At what points does this curve intersect? the paraboloid z equals x squared plus y squared. So this is the same sort of story. I want to know for what values of t will I be able to satisfy this equation. So let me just replace everything here. Uh, z is this, so 2t minus t squared must equal x squared, which is t squared plus y squared, but y is 0. So that's it. That's all you have to do is, is solve this equation. 2t um, equals t squared. I move that one over. I'm moving both over, actually. Don't ever divide by t right now. That's a big mistake. I get t squared minus 2t equals 0. Do a GCF, factor out a t. And we get uh, t equals 0, t equals 2. So at t equals 0 and at t equals 2, I should, uh, I should live on this thing. So let's just try it. Let's just check it. If t is 0, what's r of 0? So that would be uh, 0, 0, 0. Does that satisfy this equation if I plug in 0, 0, 0? Yes. So what about at uh, 2? Well, at 2, I'm at 2, 0. Let's see, 2, 2, 2, that's 0 again. So is that right? Hold on. 2 minus 2 squares, 4, 0. Is there, this doesn't look right. Uh, what did I do? Z equals x squared plus y squared. No, that doesn't look right. It doesn't look like it, uh, it works at 2. So we have one extraneous solution here. Let me just double check everything. I think I did everything right there. Where's this 25? Oh, I know what I did. Oh, stupid rock. Having one of those days. I was doing pretty good. Um, I moved this over. This should have been 2t squared. Duh. So then this was 2t squared, and I pull out a 2t, and then this is a 1, and then this is a 1. Okay, sorry basic algebra. I was thinking about this while I was doing this problem. I was like, hey, I'd li I think I might show my algebra class this um, just to show them like this is part of a bigger problem. Um, I can show them in class like how we would need to be able to do this to do this problem. And then I sit here and I screw it up. Good job. All right, let's try one. Okay, if we plug in one, what do we get? Uh, one here, zero, and if I plug in one here, I should get a one there. And then check this into this equation. It should work, and it does. So, okay, Robert. Twenty-five. So let's see. Twenty-eight. Find the vector function that represents the curve of intersection of the two surfaces. Well, I like these problems. Twenty-eight. Let's see if I can do this one without screwing up the algebra. Twenty-eight. Um, find the vector function that represents the curve of intersection of the two surfaces. So I have a cylinder, which 
which is given to me to be x squared plus y squared equals 4. And I'm given a surface. Uh, z equals xy. Now they're not asking me to graph any of this, all right, but I'm going to try kind of to do this three-dimensionally. So let's see. So this right here, this is the equation of a circle, right, in two-dimensional space. It'd be a circle, a circle on the xy plane, which would be just be on the ground, have it a radius of two. So if I go in each direction two, right, then I draw a circle there on the ground like this. But the z uh, value, right, the z variable is free, so my z can be anything. So I draw this cylinder like this. All right, there's my cylinder, right? And now I have another surface, which I'll do in a different color, which is this right here. So what I think what I'll do there is I will graph uh, try and graph this. It's going to be at the origin. Yeah, I know that's true. Um, what happens if, if x is 0 here? If x is 0, then it doesn't matter what y is, right? y can be anything. y is free. But then z would be 0. So imagine that the x coordinate is 0. The y coordinate can be anything you want, right? But the z must be 0. It's going to basically draw a line this so far. Now I could have done the same thing. I could have let y be 0, then x would be free, and z would still be 0. So that would draw me a line in this direction. All right. Now let's try and do something here. This is going to be kind of tricky. Let's let x be a positive number, and let's let y be a positive number. So that would put me on the x-axis positive, the y-axis positive. So pick some point somewhere in here on the flat sheet of paper. It, it would be like the first quadrant on the flat sheet of paper. Remember, this is x and y. Um, if I let that happen, then what happens? I multiply these two positive numbers together, I get a positive z value. So I'm going to be somewhere up, which is in the what? Remember the octants, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. The bottom is 5, 6, 7, 8. So this would be in the first octant. You would have this this sheet coming up. It's really going to be hard to draw on here. Um, maybe from here it goes up, goes up and goes back to the origin. Just imagine kind of like this sheet up here. And it's getting bigger as I go out. The bigger that the x and the y get, the bigger and higher up it gets. Now, <clears throat> so I'm going to put here, you would be an octant one if that happened. Now what if x is uh, positive, but y is negative? So that would put you x is positive, but y is negative, which would be over there. So what would happen there? Well, over there you get a negative number, right? Multiplying positive and negative. So now your sheet over here would go down. So it would go down over here. And you could do this. You'd be in uh, octant. What octant would that be? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You would be in octant eight. I'll just put eight. Octant one. All right, you can do this, but you get this kind of idea that this is sheet of paper. It, it does, or not a sheet, like, a, like a, a sheet on a bed, right, floating around in space here. And you've got, it, it does touch the axes, the x-axis and the y-axis, it touches. But over here, it goes up, over there it goes down, and then you can check the other back. But what we're trying to find here is where this, where, where the cylinder and the sheet hit each other. Whoa, find the vector function that would draw the intersection of those. And that seems like a really tough problem, but it turns out that it's not. Here's how we're going to do it. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and draw the cylinder. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the cylinder. I can do this. 2 cosine t. 2 sine t. That would draw me a circle in the xy plane. The thing is, right, this would draw me, that would draw me a circle this way. Remember on the cylinder though, the z was free. It could go up and down. 
So wherever these two hit each other, any point that, that these two intersect, definitely the point has to be on this, right? For sure. So this, if I draw this vector function so far, this should contain some of the points. Right now it would be, here's the origin. This would draw right now just that circle. So definitely all these points along the circle are on that cylinder. Now do they match, do they hit this? We don't know yet. So what about this last component? <clears throat> the last component for this cylinder, it's free. So how do I say free? Well, I can't. That's why I can't use this to draw the cylinder because this, this will draw a curve, not a whole, a, a whole surface. But in order to live on the surface, you must satisfy this equation. So that means your z value must be equal to your x value times your y value. So my z value here must be equal to my x value times my y value. So it should be um, this times this, 4 cosine t sine t. Just multiply those two together. If we sketch this, it should be the intersection of those two surfaces. All right, what's next? 29, I'm gonna leave 29 to you. And then 39 through 63, holy moly. Is that supposed to be 63? Yes, it is. Okay, I think this is a good time to stop for now. I wanted to take a minute to, to um, talk about 28 again real quick. Just, we had come up with um, 2 cosine t, 2 sine t. Four cosine t sine t, and we said we that this would draw the intersection of that cylinder with that weird surface. So I want to just point out that this right here is the same as two times two sine t cosine t, and that these from uh, precal that's this right here is this uh, two sine t cosine t is sine two t. So this is really just 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, and then this is just 2 sine 2t. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening here. We already said that in the xy plane, this draws, okay, this is x, here's y, here's z. We said in the xy plane that this draws a circle of radius 2, this does but the z coordinate is dictated by this. So what I'd like to do is just pick a couple of points here. Let's let t be 0, see what we would get. <clears throat> we get uh, cosine of 0 is 1, so that's 2. Um, sine of 0 is 0, so that's 0. And then sine of 0 is 0, so that's 0. <clears throat> so we'd be out here at uh, 1, 2, 0. So that's where we'd be. That point lives on the cylinder, and it lives on the... Um, weird surface. And remember the cylinder was this x squared plus y squared equals 4 and then the weird surface was z equals x, y. Notice that if we replace x with uh, 2, y with 0, and z, z with 0, this equation is true and this equation is true at the same time. So you can check them yourself. Now let's let t be, I'm going to say uh, pi over 2 because that's an easy one to evaluate. So Cosine of pi over 2 is going to be 0, so we get 0 here. Sine of pi over 2 is 1 times 2 is 2. And then be careful here. We're going to plug pi over 2 in here. Pi over 2 times 2 is pi. Sine of pi is negative 1, but then times 2, so we get negative 2. So we'd be 0 on the x-axis, 2 on the y-axis, and then down to 1, 2, like this. 
All right. <clears throat> Maybe we should take one in between there. Yeah, let's do one in between here. How about t is pi over 4? Okay, so if we do that, cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2 times 2 is root 2. And then sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, then times 2 is root 2 again. And then pi over 4 right here. We do 2 times pi over 4, that's pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is going to be um, 1. And then, um, why did I say sine? This was 0. Shit. This should have been 0. Sine of, sine of pi is uh, 0. Okay, <laughs> uh, power, sine of pi over 2, right, is 1, so times 2, so we should be at 2 here. So we should go out root 2, which is 1.41, somewhere around there, and then over 1.41, so somewhere around here. Then we should go up 2, 1, 2, so somewhere around there. So what's happening here is that we're on this circle, right? We're, we're on this circle. Imagine this circle like this. That's a circle, and then we have this cylinder. What's happening is we're actually drawing a little sine curve, all right, part of a sine curve here on the outside of that cylinder. So it might be easier for me to show this to you with a picture. Um, yeah, give me a second. really hard to see this on a picture, so I'm going to try and make a cylinder here. So here's our cylinder, all right? So let's imagine that the x-axis comes popping out of here. So I'm going to label that x. And then the y-axis, let's say, would be popping out over here. Okay, so what's happening is that in this first little, from, from here to here, Right? What's happening is we're drawing the first little arc of a sine, like this. And then the back side, now look, here's the x-axis. If it punches through the back side, it would be here. And it's going to draw over here the bottom part of the sine. And then when we come around, the z-axis is going to come out here. It's going to draw top part and then another bottom part. So remember that when you put 2t in here, this is going to make your period, right? The period of a uh, sine or cosine function is 2 pi divided by this number in front, which is pi. The, the period of these two is, is 2 pi. So what happens is we, we draw, we go all the way around the cylinder in 2 pi, but we draw two of these in 2 pi. So our z coordinate draws two sine curves in one rotation around the cylinder. I hope that makes sense. Sorry I messed up that point, but all right. Well, I guess you could do this to imagine this. Your z coordinate, you take this part. There you go. There was the x axis, y axis, the x axis out the other side, the y axis out the other side, and the z. So you can see here two sine curves, right, wrapped around the cylinder. That's what, that's what that is. All right. So where were we? Um, 39. <clears throat> Might be able to just do a few of these to get you going here. 39. Find the derivative. Yeah, these. These are probably going to be pretty straightforward. So for 39, r of t equals, this is just going to be whether or not you remember how to take derivatives. t sine t 
t squared uh, t cosine 2t. Okay, so the derivative of this vector function is going to be the derivative of each component separately. So here we have a product rule. So sine t um, plus t cosine t. That's what you get when you take product rule there. Derivative t squared is 2t. Another product rule here, it'll be cosine 2t minus uh, 2t sine 2t. So I'm not going to go through the work, but, well, I'll just show it to you. Derivative of this one is 1 times this here, plus the derivative of cosine of something is negative sine. So you get negative, you get negative sine 2t, but then times the derivative of what's inside, which is 2, then times the first function, which is t, and then when you put these together, you get this. So there's your derivative. 40, 41, 42, I'll do 40, 42, I guess. <clears throat> Vector function. Now they give you the ijk I, form. So I'm going to convert this. A, T cosine 3t, b sine cubed t, and finally c cosine cubed t. All right, so a, b, and c here are constants. We don't know what they are. So just treat them like constants when you take the derivative. So just come along for the ride. Um, a, and then now let's do product rule here. So, well, you know what, I'll treat these together. So what's derivative of that? It's A times this one, cosine 3t, plus the derivative of this one, which is negative sine of 3t, times the derivative of what's inside, 3 times the AT. Okay, so that's the derivative of the first component. This one, B is going to come along for the ride. Derivative of sine cubed t is 3 sine squared t times cosine t. So chain rule, you have to take derivative of sine also. And the last component, I'm out of room here. Um, c comes along for the ride. Same thing that we did before, 3 uh, uh, cosine squared t, but then times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine t, and that's it. So you could clean that up, but that's your, that's your, your raw derivative there. So 42, checking these. Okay, looks good. I thought 44 looked interesting. So it says 44. R of t equals t times the vector a crossed with the vector b plus t times the vector c. And this is weird because they don't tell you what, what the vector A, what the vector B, and what the vector C is, right, at all. But we know it's a vector, right? So all we're using is properties, properties of cross products here. So before I do anything, I'm just going to simplify what this is. So... Um, Let's see, how should we expand this? To, um, this would be T A cross B, right? T A cross B plus T A um, cross T C. So what I'm doing is I'm using a property. Let me go back in the book and show you where that property is. 
This was cross product, so this is way back in the day. There we go. This is property three on page on page um, 562. So we know that A cross B plus C equals A cross B uh, plus A cross C. That's what I'm doing here. So I'm treating this whole thing as A and I'm crossing it with B there, then A and then crossing it with C there. All right. Then I can use the fact that this constant can come out. So T times A cross B plus, and then this T and this T both come out, so T squared A cross C. And I believe that's, that's all they want. Yeah, that's it. So now we just take the derivative. So the derivative of this, you just take derivative of the t part. So the derivative of that is 1 times that. So a cross b plus derivative of that, which is 2t, and then a cross c. <clears throat> on this piece right here, just so you know, on this right here, um, I'm using property two. Property two says if you have a constant times a vector A crossed with the vector B, that this is equal to the constant times A cross B. So when I was sitting right here, and I went from here to here, just so you're clear on this, um, first let's look at this. I'm going to look at this as a constant, A cross something. So I'm going to pull the, con the constant out, A cross T, C like that. And now for this one, I use a property again. This right here is equal to A cross C, right? But then Okay, so this right here is this with the T on the outside like that. So I can pull that T out of the cross. And then these T's come together to give me this, just so you know. All right. All right, that's 44. <clears throat> so now we're working on 45. And my battery's okay. So 45, find the unit tangent vector, capital T of T, at the point in the given value. So they give you R of T equals cosine T, 3T, 2 sine 2T. Two and at the value, T equals 0. All right, so we have to go back and take a look at the formula for capital T of t, which is the unit tangent vector. Uh, let me see. The formula we have, I believe, did we give you two of them in this section? I believe we gave you two. No? I don't have my class notes in here. I just have the book. All right, so capital T of t. equals the derivative over its magnitude. So it's a derivative function over its length. I swear there is another one in this section. I have to go back and look at my notes. I don't have them. Hmm. Okay, well, for now, let's just, let's just stick with this. 
All right, so I need a couple of things. I need the derivative first. So let me find the derivative. Uh, negative sine t, 3. And then here, the 2 is going to come for the ride. Derivative of sine of 2t is cosine 2t, but then times 2 again. So chain rule. This will be a 4. So there's your derivative. And now what I want to do is I want to scale it by its own length. So let me find the length of this derivative. It's magnitude, which is the square root of, and now we get to start squaring stuff. So this squared is sine squared t plus, that's 9, plus 16 um, cosine squared 2t, like that. All right, so is there any way we can clean this up a little bit? Well, I think we can. Let's just take a look at the inside here. Um, we can use some identities from pre-cal. Okay, so remember, first of all, what is, what is cosine of 2t? And there were some equivalent formulas. Um, if you refer to your formula sheets, these would be on, let's see, this would be on reference page two, the double angle formulas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the one where I'm allowed to change that cosine 2t into 1 minus 2 sine squared t. So that's what, I, that's what I have right here. I can change that if I'd like into that. Um, where are we on here? I lost my place. Oh. I lost my position. And I am totally lost. Uh, find the unit tangent vector. Okay, 45. Okay, so. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm making this a little harder than it has to be. I'm trying to come up with a formula for this, but they're giving us the t equals 0. So all we have to do is plug 0 into both of these, and then we have this. So um, at, at 0, right, plug in 0, plug in 0. Let's see what we get. So what is the r? What is the derivative vector at 0? So sine of 0 is 0, so I get the vector 0, 3, and then cosine of 0 is 1, so I get 4. I'm going to divide that by its own length, which here, sine of 0 is 0, so I get square root of 0 plus 9, and then cosine of 0 is 1, squared is 1, 16, so 9 plus 16. So that's uh, 20, uh, root 25 on the bottom, which is 5, so I'm going to divide each of these by 5. 0, 3 fifths, 4 fifths. Yeah, sorry, we don't need the identities because we're not trying to find a general formula. We're trying to find the, um, the unit tangent vector at zero. So it makes the problem so much easier. Okay. Now for number 45, I think you can handle, I mean, sorry, 46, 47, 40. 47, let me do 47, it's a little different than 46. So for 47, they give you R of T <coughs> equals T t squared, t cubed, you're asked to find the following, r prime t, capital T of 1, r double prime t, and r prime t crossed with r double prime t. Four different things. So let's first find the derivative. 1, 2t, 3t squared. All right, um, that's done. 
All right, find the um, tangent vector at one. This is the derivative at one over the magnitude of the derivative at one. So what happens if I plug one in there? I get one, two, three. And then the magnitude at one, so the magnitude of of those squared when you plug in one, so one squared plus two squared plus three squared, which is, let's see, nine plus four, 13, 14, so root 14, so one over root 14, two over root 14, three over root 14. Just double check these, so, yep, okay, now we've got this. What's the second derivative? Well, the second derivative, I'll just put it up here, is the derivative of this one, which is 0 to 6t. So I've got this. And now I'm going to cross the derivative with its second derivative. So I'm going to take the vector 1, 2t, 3t squared. I'm going to cross it with the vector 0 to 6t. And then I'm going to do what I've done in the past when I cross two vectors. If I want to get the i component, so if I'm going to cross these two, get the i component, I cover up i, I've got what here? This times this, that's 12t squared. Take away 6t squared, which is 6t squared. Now I cover up this one. 1 times 6t is 6t, 0 times that is 0. So I have 6t, but then I subtract it, so minus 6t. And I cover up this one. Uh, 2 take away 0, it's just 2. All right. That's all they that wanted. OK. So you should be able to do number 48. It's very similar to that one, except they ask you for some different stuff. Um, all right, 49. Find the parametric equations for the tangent line to the curve at the get, with the given parametric equation at the specified point. Okay. So I'll do one of these. So 49. They give you a vector function has parametric equations one plus, oh, one plus root 2t, ah, come on, root 2t. The y component is t cubed minus t. The z component is t cubed plus t. And we're looking at the point 3, 0, 2. OK, so imagine that if you were to draw this, this is a curve in three-dimensional space, right? Whatever it's doing, doesn't matter, it's three-dimensional. And at, at a certain point on that curve, exactly the point 3, 0, 2, right? There's some, there's some direction, like when you draw this, there's a direction that the curve's being drawn in. Then there's some tangent vector here. And that tangent vector creates a line, right? So I'm trying to find the parametric equation for the line, this line right here, the parametric equations. So a couple of things. What do we need for a line? What do we need for the equation of a line, the vector equation of a line? Well, we need a point and we need a direction. In fact, we always call that direction vector v. The point would give us the r naught. So that's what I need. This is what I need for the vector equation of a line. This is back in the previous section. All right, so the question right now is, do we have a point? Well, yeah, of course we do. We have this point, 3, 0, 2. So I've got this taken care of. What I need is a direction vector. So the direction vector is this vector here, the blue one. But that blue one is actually the derivative of this vector function at some point in time, right, at a specific point in time, which, which I don't know right now. They didn't give me the point in time. 
but I should be able to figure out what that point in time is by looking at the point. So what, what t would I plug in here to get 3, 0, 2? So, um, hmm. 3, 0, 2, is that the point? Oh, you know what, I wrote this backwards. This is this, that, that makes things a lot easier, okay. It was 2 root t. Yeah, I'm making lots of mistakes today. So I think it's obvious if t is 1, that this will work. I'll get this point. So if that's 1, this is uh, 2 plus 1, that's 3. If that's 1, I get 0. If that's 1, I get 2. So this is it. t is 1. So what I really want to know is what's the derivative here at 1? Right? That's what I want. So I, I first need the derivative. The derivative at 1, right? is equal to my direction vector of my line. So let me get my derivative first. The derivative of this is, let's see, derivative 1 is 0, derivative of this, uh, cover the 2. So derivative of square root t is 1 over 2 root t, then times 2. So this is 1 over root t. And then derivative of this is 3t squared minus 1. Derivative of this is 3t squared plus 1. And now let's plug 1 in. So what's the derivative at 1? That would be, let's see, 1. Uh, this would be 3 minus 1 is 2. And then uh, 3 plus 1 is 4. So this should be the vector 1, 2, 4. So I'm ready to come up with the uh, vector equation of my line using these two things. Now I am going to do something a little different. We, we in the past have used r of t, but r has already been used. So I'm going to call it s of t. S of t is going to be r naught, which is the point written as a vector, plus t times v, and v is my direction vector 1, 2, 4. <coughs> which means that S of t is, uh, can put, put these components, components together, 3 plus t. 0 plus 2t, so 2t, and 2 plus 4t. And that's the vector equation of, of this blue line right here. It'll draw this blue line. Now, they want it in parametric form. So x is 3 plus t, y is 2t, z is 2 plus 4t. And let me just double check that. 3 plus t, 2t, 2 plus 4t. Yep, that's it. Okay, so number uh, 50, 51, and 52 are done the same way. The functions are a little more complicated. 53. Find the vector equation of the tangent line to the curve of intersection of the cylinder, blah, 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 and blah, 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 at the point. All right, that 53 is a good problem. <clears throat> Took me a second reading it to understand what they wanted. So for 53, we want to well, I was supposed to be doing odds here. Whatever. Stop paying attention to that. Uh, find a vector equation of a tangent line to the curve of intersection of these cylinders. So you have two cylinders. That one, and, and then they give you a point. All right, so we have two cylinders. This is a cylinder that has a radius of 5, and it opens up the z-axis like this. It goes up the z, right? And then this one 
Um, the x is free, so it's going to come out the x-axis. It has a radius of root 20, whatever that is. So it's smaller than this one. So it's like coming out the x-axis, going in, hitting here, popping out the other side like that. So where these two curves intersect each other, right, there should be some intersection of these two. And on the back side, there's some intersection also. Um, I can draw these red things with a vector equation. So I need to come up, I need to come up with um, the vector equation that draws that. Then, once I've done that, I need to go to this point, 3, 4, 3, 4, 2, which is on that curve of intersection. And I need to find the tangent line to the red curve. So it's the same as the previous problem that we have to find the line um, that's tangent to a curve, except they didn't give us the curve right off the bat. We have to find the curve ourselves. So we're trying to figure out where these two intersect each other. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with the first cylinder. I'm going to draw that with a vector equation. I'm going to call it C1 of T, all right? Cylinder 1 of T. And that has, how do I draw a circle radius 5? So 5 cosine T. 5 sine t, right? And the z is free. However, this equation gives us a restriction on z. This tells us that z uh, squared must be equal to 20 minus y squared, which means z must be plus or minus uh, square root 20 minus y squared. And I'm going to only look at the positive, and the reason why is because there's two curves here. Right, the front one and the back one. Um, if I'm going to be looking at the point 3, 4, 2, my z coordinate is positive, which means I need this to be the positive case. So I'm just going to look at that right there. Okay, so my z coordinate right here must satisfy this equation. So it must satisfy that root 20 minus y squared. But y, remember, is this. So square that, you get 25 sine squared t. That is the vector equation. Um, sorry, I should just call this because um, it's not the. This is not the vector equation of this cylinder. It's their intersection. So why don't we just call it? Um, I don't want to call it R. Um, intersection crossing, uh, however you want. Um, I'll just call it uh, S of T. All right, and then I'll let this one be the R. All right. So there it is. Now I'm going to verify my work so far before I start taking derivatives. Yeah, that's it. So at this point, I need to know um, um, what the derivative of this is. So you know what? This is r. I'm getting upset with myself for switching so many of my things today. Just It's a Monday for sure. Look, I'm, I'm looking for the red. This is it. I call it R. Look, this by itself would draw this cylinder, but once I restrict that z coordinate, then it draws the, the intersection, which is what I'm calling R. So I need the derivative now, right? Because remember, I'm trying to find this green line that goes forever in each direction. I need a point. I need a direction vector. I have a point. Here it is. I, have an, I need a direction vector. The direction vector should be the derivative of this right here at some point in time. I'm going to have to go figure out what that point in time is here in just a second. Um, so what do we got derivative wise? So take derivative here, you get negative 5 sine t. And then take derivative there, you get 5 cosine t. And then this derivative actually sucks pretty bad. Um, chain rule. So 1 over 2 roots of all this times the derivative of what's inside. So derivative 20 is, is gone. Derivative of this, the 2 comes out. So negative 50 sine t times derivative of sine, which is cosine t. That should be it. My phone is going crazy. All right, now how do you find t?
That's going to be tricky. Right? So all I need to know now to get my direction vector is to figure out what point in time makes, gives me the point 3, 4, 2. All right, that's not obvious, is it? So let me see if I can convince you of what it is. Okay, what I know first is that this right here, right, this right here has to turn into a 3, this one has to turn into a 4, and that one down there has to turn into a 2. So let me just first try and make 5 cosine t turn into 3. Well, that's cosine t is 3 fifths. And then I can get on my calculator and I can figure out what arc cosine of 3 fifths is. Right? Figure out what that is. Then, I also need that 5 sine t equals 4 which means that sine of t must be 4 fifths. And I can, f I can go on um, and figure that out. But if you notice, we've got a 3, a 4, a 5. This looks like a, a right triangle, a 3, 4, 5 triangle, 3, 4, 5. Here's t. Let's see if this works. Um, sine of t here would be opposite over hypotenuse. That's this. Um, cosine of t would be adjacent over hypotenuse. That's 3 fifths. So, so this looks like the correct triangle, doesn't it? So these t's should be the same. And then the last one, well, how in the world do you figure this out? Well, that's going to be much harder. How do, how do you determine that that's 2? Well, we don't. We know that the, we're just going to trust that this angle, t, is going to work for all of them. You could, you could check it. Get on your calculator, figure out what this is, okay? And then plug that in right here, and you, would, you should get 2. All right, so once you have t now, once you have T, um, you can go and you can uh, get the value of the derivative at that T. So watch how I'm going to do this. This is going to be very clever. What is the derivative of the function at the T, which is this value, which I'm going to say I don't know what it is. Well, it's negative 5 sine T. Well, what was sine T? 4 fifths. So what's negative 5 times that? What's negative 5 times 4 fifths? Negative 4. Okay, 5 cosine t. What was cosine t? 3 fifths. So what's 5 times 3 fifths? Well, that's just 3. This one might be a little bit harder. Um, what's sine squared t? So what's this squared? That's 16 20 fifths. Okay, multiply it by 25. And what do you get? 16. What's 20 minus 16? 4. What's square root of 4? That's 2. What's 2 times 2? That's 4. So this is just 1 fourth times, over here, sine t times cosine t. That's 4 fifths times cosine t, which is 3 fifths times negative 50. So uh, what? This is 25, goes into 50 twice. And then, um, so this is going to reduce out to be a 2. So we have negative 2 times 4 times 3. That's 24, so negative 24. And that's just negative 6. So this is the vector negative 4, 3, negative 6. Going to check it. Yes. All right, so now I'm ready for the equation of the line. This is nuts. So the equation of my line, which I'm called call RT, was the uh, point turned into a vector. Uh, 3, 3, 4, 2, plus t times my direction vector, which was negative 4, 3, negative 6. And I think we've done this enough. Put those together. You're good. All right, 55. Should be able to do 55. 57, let me give you a hint on 57, you have two curves, they give you uh, two curves, R1 and R2, they tell you they intersect at the origin. So you got some curve, you don't even know what it's doing, R1. 
you've got some other curve, you have no idea what it's doing, R2, but you know they hit at the origin, right? So what you're trying to find is their angle of intersection. So what you're going to do is you're going to find the tangent vector, right? So R2 prime, right there would be this blue one. And I don't have any other good colors, but let's just say R1 right here. You're going to find the tangent vector coming off of this R1 prime, right? Those two vectors, right? You can get those just by taking the derivatives at the point zero, zero, zero. Once you find those two vectors, you just have to find the angle between them. And remember how to find the angle between two vectors, cosine inverse dots divided by magnitudes. Go back and look in your notes. You should be able to get the angle. So that's 57. All right, 59 through 63. So evaluating an integral. Let me do 59. And I'll let you do the others. So 59, you have, what is the integral from 0 to 2 of the vector function? And I'm going to rewrite it in vector form t, negative t cubed, 3t to the fifth dt. So we're integrating a vector function. So integration of a vector function is fairly easy. We just integrate term by term. So this is uh, 1 half t squared. This one is minus 1 fourth t to the fourth. This one is going to be um, 3 times 1 sixth t to the sixth. So the uh, 3 sixths reduces plus some constant vector. And that constant vector we're going to rewrite that constant vector like this, c1, c2, c3, like that, right? But because this is a definite integral from 0 to 2, this constant doesn't matter, right? So with definite integrals, you don't have to worry about this constant, all right? If it wasn't a definite integral, then you would have to put this in here, and you would just add, you know, be this plus c1, this plus c2, this plus c3. So because it's definite, I don't need to worry. So all I need to do is evaluate this at these two. So first, let's, uh, let's plug in, um, let's plug in two. What happens if we plug in two here? Four, half of four is two. Plug in two here, we get 16 divided by four is negative uh, four. And then plug in 2 here, what's that, 16, um, 64 divided by 2, 32. Then we plug in 0, everything is 0, so the 0 vector. So it should just be this one right here. Let's see if I did that okay. 2, negative 4, 32. All right, and then you can do 61 and 63 yourself. All right, that's it for this section. Sorry, I was kind of all over the place this morning, a little scattery. It was a, it was a good weekend, I guess.